excited because we get to start a new little sermon series this week that uh, I've been chomping at the bit. I don't know if any of you all need it, but I know that I need it. Um, and this little sermon series is called Detoxify. And uh, detoxifying really is to, to remove any toxic substances or qualities from our lives. And toxins really are anything that are bad or unpleasant or harmful or, or maybe even poisonous to us. And I know if, if the sermon title's up there, some of you English majors are probably looking at it and going, there's another one of your typos again, Pastor John. Detoxify is spelled with a Y, right? And I'll have you know, though, that I spelled it like that on purpose because as I was praying about this sermon series and as God was speaking to me and downloading to me, um, he shared a little bit with me and I couldn't let go of those last two syllables, the if I. And so I spelled it like that on purpose because God really told me, he said, you know, there is no magic pill and there's no secret to getting rid of unwanted stuff in our lives. And, and I think sometimes we expect God to be the one responsible to do it for us, and it's his, not his responsibility either. And we get mad at him, or we get upset when he doesn't do things on our time frame, or he doesn't just, he doesn't just naturally just automatically deliver us from stuff, and, and, and we get upset. But, but it takes some action on our behalf. It takes an if I. Say that with me right now. If I... You know, and I'll give you some examples of that. Here we go. You ready? If I, if I don't go on Amazon.com, then maybe I won't buy some stuff I don't necessarily need or spend the money I don't necessarily have so that I can't save when I really do. And if you maybe need a little shopping detoxification, that might be a good one for you, right? How many of y'all have some shopping detox to go through, right? How about this one? If I... If I don't bake those double chocolate chip cookies, right, then I won't feed that sweet tooth. And believe me, that's what I gave up over the holidays here, and it's been working all right. But, but if you need a little sugar detox, maybe that's one for you. Or how about if I, if I don't go to that bar, then maybe I won't be subjective to having too much to drink. That might be good if you need a little party and or alcohol detox. Or how about if I don't have that inappropriate conversation with that coworker, then I might not continue to feel more dissatisfied with my marriage and be tempted to cross the line. That might be good if you don't want to end up in divorce court, just throwing it out there or sleeping on the couch, right? If I... Well, if I, after a holiday full of indulgences, if maybe I need a little help, or maybe for you it's been a whole season... And I don't know for you, maybe you're like me. It feels like 19 or 2019 was just a year full of toxic junk on so many levels. Anybody relate to me on that? Anybody deal with some toxic stuff in 19? It was a hard year, wasn't it? Well, whatever situation you're going through, whatever it is you got right now, I do, I've got to believe that we could all use a little detoxifying. Amen? And the crazy part about this is, is this, is, is that some of us in this room today, we've forgotten how good we can feel, both physically as well as spiritually, because we are so bogged down with toxins in our lives. So how many of y'all are ready to do a little detoxifying with me, get back on track and start this new year out, all right? Yeah. And I'm just curious too, how many of y'all do New Year's resolutions? Let me see some hands. Kind of like three of you. That's awesome. The rest of you are like, I just know I'm not going to do it anyway, so why even try, right? Um, you know, <laughs> how many of you have already broke your New Year's resolutions, and that's why you're not raising your hand, right? Or, or how many of you are waiting until this upcoming Monday? Uh, any of you like those Monday people? Like, we'll start, we'll get on track Monday, right? And that Monday just can, like, it's an eternal Monday. That's what we do at the Petrie House. But, but uh, during the next few weeks of this study, we're we're probably going to touch on some of the things that may apply to some of those New Year's resolutions that you've set. Or, or if you haven't set any, maybe some of these will touch on something that you wanted to set a resolution in. So, so I hope and I pray that this series will give you some motivation as well as maybe some tools and some scriptures to back it up and help you achieve some success in 2020, okay? But I want to say this though, is in this series, we're not going to set the bar so high and make these goals so unattainable that we fail. 
that we don't experience some success because I believe that we have to experience some success. That's why resolutions fail. And for example, and I'll just throw this out. I'm not going to ask you to commit to reading your Bible for the next 355 days or 353 days left in this year because I know you probably won't do it. I mean, I, I'm in my Bible a lot and, and I probably won't do it. And I'm a lead pastor of a church. And so I'm not going to say, hey, all right, commit to the next 353 days to be in your Bible every single day. Because of this, I know that if you experience a little victory in your life, if you experience a little taste, hopefully it will encourage you to want to do some more if I's. And if you experience some sex success in those, then ultimately they will become a lifestyle for you. I had a little Freudian slip right there. Some of you are like, <laughs> some of you men are like, yeah, I want to experience some sex, right? <laughs> If you have children in the audience, you may want to get them out right now, I'm just saying. So, oh my goodness, it's a good thing Lindsay's not here this morning, right? But, whew, okay, take a deep breath on that one. <laughs> so let's just try it for the next seven days, right? Sex for the next seven, no. Um, let's just try these, these, these things, whatever we talk about, for the next seven days. So from Monday to Sunday, as we talk about stuff, Give it a shot for a week. And if you experience some success in it, then try, try doing it a little bit longer. And hopefully it'll become a lifestyle or habit for you. Sound good? Yes. All right? Okay. Well, let's start out. Let's open our Bibles. Let's really pray to God for some help. Um, but open your Bibles or your smart devices. Let's look at a passage that, that really will be our anchor passage for the next few weeks as God allows uh, this series to, to kind of grow. Um, but we find it in 2 Corinthians. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians. We're going to go to chapter 6, and we're going to start with verses 14 to 18. And then we're going to look at verses, uh, chapter 7, verse 1. So turn with me there. We'll also put it up on the screen if you don't have a Bible handy, if you've given up your technology, right? But here we go. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting out verse 14. It says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will make my dwelling among them, and I will walk among them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst, and be separate from them, says the Lord. And, no un and let no unclean, no, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And 7, uh, verse 1 says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. You know, basically what Paul is doing here, he starts out by giving us five different examples of things that don't really go together. It's kind of like that children saying, which one is not like the other, right? And he says, there's five things really that, that don't go together. Things like righteousness and lawlessness, right? Or things like light with darkness or Christ with Belial. Belial was another name for Satan. And really what he's trying to say here is that there are things that we allow into our lives that can be toxic if we're not careful, just like being yoked with unbelievers. Now, if you're not familiar with what a yoke is, uh, I think here's a picture of one. Okay, that's not it, Jamie. That's funny. That's it. That's good. I appreciate that one. We have a bunch of jokers in this place. Um, that's the right yoke. And if you're not familiar with a yoke, basically it's a large piece of wood that, that then has something that hooks two animals together around the neck. And it keeps them in step with each other. It keeps them working together. It keeps them close. Now, Paul's not saying here that we can't associate with unbelievers because that's what we're called to do, right? That's the great commission. We are to reach the lost. So he's not saying that we can't be close with unbelievers, but what he is saying is that he's warning us that we have to be careful just how close we allow them in and we allow them to be, and even more so, how much we allow them to influence us and our path or our walk with Jesus. 
Now, I personally experienced a little of this influence thing over the last few weeks. My son, who's a believer, not going there with it, he is a believer, um, I think, um, but, but I experienced some influence with my son Noah. We've spent a lot of time in the car together. We've been going to hockey practice after hockey practice after hockey game. And, and so this whole Christmas break has been hockey, hockey, hockey. And, and so my son figured out that my phone pairs with my truck every time I get in. And it automatically starts my music. So he created his own playlist called Dad's Car Playlist. He thought he was really being slick, right? And so he put a bunch of his music on my phone, on my Apple iTunes account, so that when I get in the car, it automatically defaults to his music. Now, he doesn't listen to bad stuff. I mean, he's got some secular artists on there, but he's kind of into, he's got all the new Kanye West stuff going on, like Kanye West is singing about closed on Sunday and Chick-fil-A. It's in my head now. I can't get rid of it. But, but he's got that, and he's got some rapper. He's got, like, uh, I think it's NF. Uh, and, and so he's got all this stuff on his, his uh, playlist. And, and what has happened is my Caleb now doesn't really get turned on anymore. I've kind of gotten used to this other playlist. And so the other day, I'm by myself. And, and the, the volume's up, I'm not going to lie, and, and NF was on there, and, and my subs are thumping, and, and I come rolling into this intersection, and I'm just, I'm rapping it, right? And I look over, and this poor little old lady, she is shivering next to me, and I see her reaching down like she's grabbing a bottle of mace like I'm going to carjack her or something, you know? But, but the, the, the point I'm getting at here is that, that my Caleb's gone, and now I've been influenced by this other music, and it was such a subtle way. It just kind of creeped on in there, and now I'm a rapper. In fact, my kids actually... They actually caught me on video and tried to sneak it in, and I kiboshed that, and I said, Jamie, I will not allow you to do video if you ever put that up. So, um, but they actually thought it was really funny. No, not happening. Um, but, but Noah was actually like, Dad, like, you rock that, man. Maybe the next time you can, you can rap with me. I don't know. Maybe we will. Who knows? But, um, but here's the thing, is that that influenced in such a subtle and such a such a a, a a way, but but things like that can happen that are much more dangerous, that are much more toxic if we're not careful. Things that we're exposed to on TV late at night, or or things that we're exposed to sometimes amongst coworkers, or or even toxins that are, we're exposed to in our, our bodies, medications that start out for right and end up wrong. There's different things that if we don't watch out, we can end up all toxed out. And so here in verse 1 of chapter 7, what we find is we find Paul telling us that it is beneficial for us to stop and to evaluate our lives and to detoxify, or the term he uses is to cleanse our bodies and our spirits in order for us to fully experience the promises of God, okay? And what are these promises? Well, God tells us in verse 16 that we just read, he says that I will make my dwelling among you and I will walk among you and you'll be my peeps. I mean, that's what God says right there. I mean, turn to your neighbor and say, I want to be God's peep, right? He says he'll make us his peeps. And he says then, I will be a father to them. And they will be sons and daughters. Church family, I'm going to tell you right now, what a comfort for the new year to know that the creator of all the heavens and the earth, the creator of the seen and unseen, the creator of everything who owns everything and commands everything to be and controls everything, what a promise and what a comfort knowing that he is going to consider us sons and daughters. Can I get an amen to that? I mean, I feel like I'm preaching up here, I hope, right? But today as we kick off this series, I want to start by talking about doing a little detoxifying of our physical lives or our bodies, something that's very tangible, something that we could get our minds around, okay? And I, and I know when I say detoxify and I say our physical or our bodies, the first thing that probably comes to mind is what we consume or what we eat, right? 
And that's definitely part of it. What we put in our bodies, what we take into our bodies can have a very big impact. In fact, they can make us physically, the things we eat can physically make us cesspools. I've always wanted to use that word in a sermon, right? That's a very visual, very visual word, right? Make us cesspools of sin, right? But it makes us cesspools. And now, I can, I can Bible this up a little bit. The Greek word for cesspools is volthrosh. Say that with me right now. Say volthrosh. You didn't think I was not going to allow you to learn a new Greek or Hebrew word today, right? So there it is. So now you can say cesspool and volthrosh, right? And so you can even say it and people won't even know what you're talking about. You can be like, you're a volthrosh mouth, right? And they'll be like, what? And it doesn't matter. But, but there is a wealth of information out there when it comes to physical health. I mean, you can, there's lots of good, solid documentaries on Netflix. Some of them are ridiculous, but there's some good stuff out there, and there's some good research on the internet, and some of the news and the media. There's, there's stories about all the toxins in our diet, and I encourage you to, to dig into that a little bit. There's things that, uh, how many of you are familiar with the GMO? What, does anybody know what a GMO is? GMO stands for genetically modified organisms. There are a lot of our foods that have been genetically modified. They have been altered to create their own pesticides. I know that sounds crazy, but they have been altered so that they stop. Bugs don't even want to eat them. I mean, that should give you an idea, right? And they've been altered so they grow to abnormal sizes or they, they have, you know, taste that they taste like something that they weren't even made to be tasted like. Like how many of you have ever eaten cotton candy grapes? Oh, that's good, right? You're like, what are you talking about? They make cotton candy grapes, and I'm telling you, God did not make them that way, okay? There is something that happened inside of them. They have been modified. It would be like if an apple tasted like you already put peanut butter on it. How many like apples and peanut butter? Okay, now I got a few of you raising hands. That's good, but, but there's just some things that God didn't make to be that way, but we have scientifically figured out how to alter some stuff. And even when we stray away from stuff like genetically modified organisms, if we're not careful, if we're meat eaters, guys, oh, oh, right? Some, Lindsay's not here. I could talk about eating meat, right? But if you're meat eaters, we still have to be careful because if we eat things that are eating all the genetically modified organics, then we're still having that stuff introduced to our body. And we are what we eat, right? Well, they are what they eat. I keep telling Lindsay that. I'm like, you know, when I eat bacon, that pig ate a bunch of vegetables. He's a vegetarian, so I, by default, I'm vegetarian, right? I'm eating vegetarian, right? Yeah, I'm claiming that in the name of Jesus, right? But even, but even so, then you've got all this stuff and they've been pumped with antibiotics because of the harsh environments they're raised in or, or they've been pumped with hormones so they grow at a quicker rate for production and for profitability or, or, or then you have the chemicals that are used to process our foods. There are chemicals that we use in the United States that aren't even legal to be used in other countries. There's things like dyes, you know? I mean, there are, there are dyes out there. The industry, people don't realize this, the food industry uses over 15 million pounds of artificial dyes in our foods every year. And over 40% of that dye, 40% of it is red dye. They use it to color stuff up to make it more appealing for us to eat. It's ridiculous. But red dye is one of the ones they use primarily. And red dye has become, and it, and it is known, it is statistically proven and research has proven all kinds of behavioral issues in children and even adults. And it comes from petroleum distillates. It comes from coal tars. Coal tar is what I use on the bottom of our houseboat to keep it from rusting. So if you don't want to rust from the inside out, go ahead and eat that stuff. But otherwise, it's toxic, right? I mean, my daughter is highly, she is allergic to red dye. So is Lindsay. I mean, they become like little red incredible hulks when they take red dye. You know, I'm going to encourage you seriously. Your children, maybe some of them struggle from, from behavioral issues. Do some research into the foods. There are so many things that we can do naturally to fix some of the things that we're dealing with in our lives. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're lucky. Y'all are lucky Lindsay isn't here this morning because you know how she likes to just come on up when I'm speaking sometimes, she would just push me out of the way right now and she'd give you a full-blown lecture on all of this organic and this healthy stuff, but it's a real deal. 
The fact is, is that we put so many toxins in our bodies every single day, things that are linked to cancer and diseases and behavioral issues and stuff that just flat out makes us feel like crap, right? Is it okay if I say that in church, right? We're okay. But it's a reality and it's a big deal. And that's why in the beginning of verse 16, and this is why I bring all this up, because you're like, what are you, why does this have to do with the Bible? This is what it has to do with. Verse 16 says, we are the temple of the living God. And if we go to 1 Corinthians, and we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, the, the word of God says this, it says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now listen, I'm not saying that you need to leave here this morning and you need to change your lifestyle to an all-organic plant-based diet. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying you need to start rubbing under your arms with Himalayan salts for deodorants, okay? Anybody ever tried one of those? They do not work, I'm just saying. I'm telling you right now, I mean, you can salt your food with them, but they do not make you not stink. I'm just, I'm going to tell you right now. But, but I'm not saying that you have to go out and make this huge radical change. But here's what I'm saying. If I, say that with me again, if I, if I understand that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and if I understand that I was bought with a price, which was the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if I understand that stuff, then what can I do to improve the condition of my temple? Amen? And it's not just because personally I want to look and I want to feel better. Those are good reasons. But the most important reason is because I want to glorify God with my temple and by my actions. So I want to challenge you for the next seven days, Monday through Sunday, can you make a little better food choices? If you don't like fruits and vegetables, maybe try some of those things. Don't get the cotton candy grapes, okay? But try eating a little more fruits and vegetables. If you eat fruits and vegetables, but you don't do uh, GMO free, uh, uh, try those out, okay? For the next seven days. Maybe cut out some of the dyes. Look at some of the packaging of the things that you're eating, some of the things that you commonly put in your body or some of the other toxic chemicals that you frequently consume. Or if you eat pretty good, how about fasting a little bit this week? You know, there's a, there's a, a new thing that, that is working and it, it has been very successful. <laughs> I am not gonna screw that word up the rest of this sermon. But it has been very successful and it's shown a lot of promising results is intermittent fasting. And basically, intermittent fasting is, is when you set an eating window. During a, a period of a day, you set a, and it's usually an eight-hour window. So you set eight hours for your eating, and you set 16 hours for fasting. That's called intermittent fasting. And so you may set your window like from, from 10 to 6, or 11 to 7, or noon to 8. Some people have been asking me, what in the world are you doing? Because you don't look like you ate your children anymore. And, and I'm like, you know, I, <laughs> that's supposed to be funny, y'all. <laughs> I'm going to have to work on some of my jokes, I can tell. But what I've been doing is I've been doing the, the intermittent fasting. You know, from noon to eight is my eating window and been cutting out the sugars because I definitely needed a sugar detox and been lowering the carbs a little bit. But, but just taking the time to make some smart decisions. Or maybe for a period of this next week, do some complete fasting. Do a water-only fast. I'm telling you, it is truly amazing about what these toxins do to impact our bodies and impact our moods and our attitudes. You, you don't realize it can cause disease, it can cure disease, it can heal our bodies, it can give us the ability to function at higher levels, or it can inhibit our productivity and our alertness. It is a reality, is what we put in our bodies is a big deal. Deal. And I know some of you know I, one of my vices is those stupid energy drinks. You know, and it, you probably, if you've been with us over the last year, we did the Daniel fast last January, February, where we, 21 days, we committed to the Daniel fast. And one of the things I did was I got rid of the energy drinks. And I tell you what, I felt amazing. I had more energy not drinking energy drinks than when I drank them. And, and I slept better and, and all kinds of benefits, but I've allowed influence to sneak in again. And now I drink a couple of them a, today, a, a day. <laughs> not already today. I haven't done that yet. But but the reality is, is that I can tell a difference when I put those kind of toxins in my body. 
But I want to clarify one thing here when it comes to some of the fasting that I'm talking about. This is more of a a healthy living type of fasting. Um, This isn't necessarily a biblical style of fasting. In a biblical fast, what would happen is you would incorporate a time of prayer um, during those times where maybe you're struggling because you want to eat, you replace that with prayer. You know, it's kind of like when you're staring at that donut, you say, Lord, help me because I'm ready to eat that right now. You know, but you spend time in prayer instead of eating. So maybe re- when you replace a meal, you pray instead of that. Or, or when you're struggling, when you're detoxing from caffeine and, and, you know, you're going through withdrawal symptoms. Anybody ever give up caffeine, the headaches and just the, the just yuckiness you feel? That's when you would go into prayer with God and you would ask him to help get you through those moments. That's more of a biblical style of of fasting. And and I want to encourage, if you do choose to do some fasting this week, incorporate prayer time into it. You may as well make it a biblical fast in addition to a healthy living kind of fast. Amen? Amen. Am I just, are you guys overwhelmed already? You doing okay? Doing okay? All right. Y'all are like, dang it, I didn't realize you were going to make me give up stuff this week, right? But, but I want to tell you, I, I'm telling you, try it out. Give it a shot and see what happens. And we did do, if you are interested in understanding more about uh, biblical fasting, we've done a couple sermons in in a couple sermon series. Last January, we did one. We did one in 18 uh, during our apprentice series. You can go back and look at those. Those are all online. But there's a second subcomponent to this whole physical thing um, and and making our bodies a temple. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it right now because there's a few more things biblically that I want to cover before we wrap up here in a few minutes. Um, But but I want to talk about physical fitness as well because that's an important component to treating our bodies as a temple of the living God. Amen? And if you have minimal physical activity, you know, if, if you, that's okay, But here's what I want you to do is if you have minimal physical activity during the week, maybe try some of these things out. You know, if there's stairs in in your workplace, maybe do the stairs instead of an elevator, right? You know, or or maybe when it comes to, uh, you know, and I'm not telling you, listen, I'm not telling you to go and get a membership tomorrow to Planet Fitness and start tithing to them like I do, okay? I mean, it's, you know, because if you don't have that as a habit, it may not be something you can easily pick up. So before you take a big step like that, and no pun intended here, but maybe just try taking a few steps around the neighborhood, right? Maybe plan a little walk around your neighborhood, and for the next seven days after supper or something, take a family walk, or just get out and walk in the morning, get a little bit of physical activity going, right? Or here's another really, really good good one. Instead of when you pull into a parking lot at the shopping center, instead of asking God to give you a front row parking spot, ask him to fill all the front row parking spots and park way out in the nosebleeders, right? Park where only the really, really nice cars park, which I'm going to tell you, they love when you park right next to them. So you just pull right up next to the really, really fancy cars, and you can even write them a little note that said, hey, I wanted to protect the passenger side of your car. That's why I parked six inches from you, right? Just put that underneath their, their, uh, their uh, door handle. They'll love you for it, right? But park a little farther out and walk to the front doors, right? Get a little bit of physical activity. Does this make sense? All right, so if getting healthy was on your resolution list, now maybe you have some biblical grounds and maybe a little bit of motivation for that too. But let's look at a few more areas that the Bible tells us that our physical bodies can use some detoxing in. Because I'm telling you, when we are toxed out physically, it messes with all the other areas of our being. In fact, Paul, one of Jesus' top apostles, right? He was like one of the super apostles. I mean, a majority of the New Testament was written by Paul. He explained his struggle in Romans chapter 6. In verses 12 to 14, this is what Paul said. He said, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. He's like, when I know spiritually what I should be doing, evil's lurking right around the corner. Anybody ever feel that sometimes? He says, it's it's right at hand. He says, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Oh, I sounded like like a southern preacher there. God, right? Uh, When I delight in the law of God, right? But uh, in my inner being. He says, when I, when I know, when I, I have it inside me. Verse 23, it says this, but I see in my members. 
Another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Church family, he's talking about our physical body. He's saying even when we know up here, even when we know in here, the physical side of us wants to take us to that toxic stuff because we enjoy that toxic stuff and it toxes us all out. And he says in verse 24, he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's a powerful verse right there. Because the body wants what the body wants, right? The flesh is a powerful thing. It is such a powerful thing. And that leads us to the next couple things that talks our bodies out. And, and the next one I want to talk about is addictions. Addictions. I mean, how many of you here struggle with an addiction? Now, I know when I say that, y'all are like, I don't deal with drugs or alcohol. But, but it's not, not just substance stuff that I'm talking about. We all struggle with something. An addiction is anything in our life that physically has control over us. Maybe for you it could be gambling or overspending or overeating. Physical fitness can be an addiction if we're over the top with it. Caffeine can be, technology can be, video gaming can be, sports can be, TV can be, a hobby can be an addiction. These are some tests to determine if you struggle with something. Do you rearrange your schedule for it? Do you spend more time on it than you should? Does it dominate your time or your thoughts? Would others around you say you have an issue with it? That's a good litmus test. Do you go places you shouldn't for it? Do you work to keep it a secret? Is it isolating you from other people? And here's a big one. Could you stop it over the next seven days if I challenged you to without it affecting you in any way? If you answered yes to one or more of those, you may have an addiction. But let me give you a little hope. Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verses 12 to 14. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Praise God. Praise God. What does it say right there? It says addictions have no dominion over us. And, and while they may feel like they have power, while they may feel like they have dominion over us, that's a lie of the enemy. Because through God's grace and his mercy and his accountability of strong believers in our lives and all around us and prayer and fasting, we can conquer any addiction in our lives and we can live in victory. Amen? Amen. But we only live in that victory if I want to. And if I seek the help to. Because our flesh, our flesh is not stronger than the spirit of God that lives within us. And if you have never invited Jesus Christ and the spirit of God into your life, I'll give you an opportunity to do that in just a minute as we wrap up. But then the last thing I want to talk about today, I know we're running out of time, but, but this is another huge toxin to our bodies and it can even become an addiction, is sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 to 18 says this. It says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with them. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin is a sin a person commits outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Church family, sexual immorality, as defined by the word of God, is any sexual relationships outside the context of marriage. And marriage, as defined by the Bible, is one man and one woman, regardless of how our government defines it. Now, 
To truly understand Paul's words, though, in this passage, you have to understand the context of the passage and what and when it was written for and to. Because in this text and in this time frame, prostitution was actually a part of Greek or Roman temple ritual and practices. It was 